Hello and welcome to another episode of Hedgehog Makes. My name is Austin, aka Zombie Hedgehog, and today we are going to be working on the Voron Tap Changer. Uh, this is a tool changer build based off of a 2.4. So in the last two episodes, I built a, well, started working on a Voron 2.4. This is an LDO kit, a 350 millimeter build with a blue frame and it is almost ready to print. So in today's episode, we are going to get this printing as sort of a hybrid 2.4 without any of the tool changing stuff in place. Make sure that it's working well, make sure that you know it can actually print well before we go and modify it to um, the Stealth Changer mod. So more on that later. As always, this is a 3D printing and making Halo. I am streaming live on Twitch right now. So if you are watching on YouTube, hi, uh, you are watching a VOD. Make sure to catch these live at twitch.tv slash zombie hedgehog. I'll have all the appropriate links in the video description. Uh, while you're down there, make sure to like the like button and hit that subscribe button if you want to see more of these types of uh, streams, VODs, etc. Sometimes I stream live onto YouTube, but um, I'll be posting videos directly onto here. So, that being said, I am live, so who do we have in chat? We have a little Debedeo. Uh, why not? Because Neb, welcome in for the first time. Shawdell, fish swimming. Welcome, welcome. Do you rotate the X extrusion? Did I rotate the X extrusion? Well, currently the printer is facing this way. So, um, that's the first thing. So why don't we, hmm, it was easy for me to work on it like this, but let me tilt it forward. Uh, now it's starting to get heavy, so now would be a good time to add handles onto the printer. Uh, the stock kit does come with handles, but I find that without without panels, it's quite easy to just grab a couple sections of the frame and move it around. But it is getting heavy. Oh boy. So the first question I have. The screen. Why the heck do these screens have a screensaver like that? Is there a way to, to disable that? I honestly have no idea, but as soon as I touch the screen, it uh, it wakes up. So I'm just curious about that. Otherwise... Uh, oh, the rotate the extrusion? No, I haven't. I haven't. Um, otherwise, let me just show you what I have working. So, right now, I have a Dragon Burner installed. As you can see, that is not Stealth Burner, that is Dragon Burner. And then I have an Orbiter on it, I have an EVB36 running temporary CAN bus with this uh, green cable that I have. Uh, it is chain flex, but it's not properly terminated or uh, strain relieved. Um, and then I have a beacon probe mounted on there, but I have the wrong type of probe. I have the version that sticks out this way, or I need the version that comes up for Voron. Uh, so with this, I can't get the full Z X or the the Y travel. Um, I've added a temporary. I've actually taken the part that typically goes here to stop the chain from coming this way, and I've mounted it onto here to act as the end stop. So it gives me a 20 millimeter buffer for this extra wiring coming out back of the extrusion. Randy, thank you for the follow. And uh, Pepe, thank you as well. What's the difference between Dragon Burner and Stealth Burner? Dragon Burner is a lot smaller. It's for, uh, it's technically a V0 tool head. So you can use it um, on a V0, but it works surprisingly well on a big printer like this because it's lightweight. It has better cooling than a Stealth Burner. And I do believe has more options than Stealth Burner. But I really like the package that it's in. It's very small. And if you really wanted to, we were discussing this, you could probably mod it so it looks kind of like a stealth burner. What the heck happened there? <laughs> what fell off? Oh, that's the heat sink. Interesting. Oh, it must have rubbed on this. Um... Yeah, must have rubbed on the uh, cable. So I do have a little bit of tuning to do. As you saw, it is using sensorless homing for the X, but 
I have an end stop here that we mounted last stream. I got that wired up. I made an extension for it. Uh, so that is working now. And I haven't done any wiring on the tool head. It's all kind of jank at the moment. Welcome in, uh, Shroop Father. Welcome, welcome. Alright. So, um, let me do one thing before we begin. And that is reduce my X uh, sensitivity. So you want, when you're doing sensors homing, you want it to just touch the touch the the end stop you don't want it to bounce around and you don't want it to home early so you want to find that perfect threshold and it really just takes tweaking so i changed the value from 100 to 110 and we're going to see if that works yeah it's a little nicer it still seemed like it it skipped a few steps so we're going to have to adjust that just play around with it we want the X homing to be as accurate as possible because eventually we're going to use these same settings, but this will be a tool changer. So we need plus or minus, you know, 0, 0.0 something tolerance when it comes to docking. So I might even decrease that a little bit more. And I can show you what I'm working with, but um, this is a... This is an LDO kit, so I use the LDO config and I've started to modify it. And it's it's very, very, very fresh. I just got this working today. So what are we looking for? The X right here on my driver um, sensorless value. It's at 110. I'm going to increase it until it homes and kind of just like stops at the end, just slowly. And I'm going to run it like this for a while to make sure that that value is good. Um, you also want to make sure your final current is set. Right now, I'm only at one amp for these motors. I could probably go higher, but I'm just sticking with one amp for now. I'm not looking to go super crazy fast on the XY for, um, for this setup, but the Z-axis will. So the Z-axis, I have disabled, sen or disabled cell chop, so it's running spread cycle. That'll allow us to go as fast as possible and be as accurate as possible. Um, the current is 0.8. That seems adequate for the steppers. I could probably increase that if needed. And it's on 32 micro steps, which I think is a good balance between uh, torque and accuracy. So we can change this back to 16 if we feel like we need more speed, but that'll be fine for now. The extruder is commented out yet because uh, I'm actually not using the stock extruder settings. I'll be using the EBB36 extruder settings. I'll have six of them. Oh boy, that'll be fun. I'll have to figure out how the heck to do that. <laughs> Piper boy, thank you for the follow. Uh, ah, awesome. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Ah, uh, the bed heater. Um, this is what... This is what was configured for the LDO bed. I'm assuming this is correct, the 104 NT, because that was in the LDO config. I haven't verified it though. It does seem to work fine, so I'll keep it as that. I did PID tune it at 100 and 110 already, so that's done. Uh, beacon, so we are temporarily installing Beacon. I tried, I actually tried to use this probe right here. I mentioned last stream, I was going to try this stock Omron probe, but it requires such a specific install that I didn't really feel like making custom cables for it and trying to figure out the config. I can't use it with an EBB36. Um, and I tried to actually use the stock wiring, but I couldn't get that to work. So I gave up. I took off my beacon from my other printer and put it on here. Um, so that's why I'm running beacon. And beacon would be great to give us a good reading on our bed and get a really good bed mesh before we start. Uh, so you get a bed mesh, here are my settings for that. Um, and all of this is, you know, due to change. I had to comment some stuff out. Uh, oh, my QGL. So for 
QGL, I actually like to increase this speed quite a bit. Stock is 100, you can actually increase it to whatever the maximum travel speed your printer is. So for this, I should be able to hit 600, fine. So I'll set that to 600. Horizontal move Z, uh, for QGL, that's how tilted your, your gantry is, how much you wanna lift it up to make sure you're not hitting it. Uh, typically, I actually use 15. I like a higher value for, for this, just in case it's skewed quite a bit. And then max adjust, 15, match that, all right. Uh, and then we have the stock macros. And I usually set a, a PID calibration macro, which is just the PID calibrate command, but as a macro. So I just copy that per config. Uh, for this one, I'm experimenting with 110C on the um, bed and 260 on the extruder. So I'll save that and restart. Then we also have the CAN bus config. So this is an EVB 36 uh, version 1.2. So it has the ADXL built in, um, but with this mount, I, I don't like running an accelerometer test with it mounted on the extruder just because it's not that rigid. Um, you really want to use a proper, you know, like a proper um, mount. In fact, why don't we do that? Yeah, let's go to the alternative worm mounts for Dragon Burner. And let's grab, um, where is it? Let's grab a PCB mount. That'll be good. So STLs, uh, let's grab Orbiter V2, long, okay. This'll give us, oh, that's not what I want. Um, oh, it's just down here, okay. Um, Dragon Burner V2, let's see if that works. So I'll try that, see if it lines up. This will give us two extra points for mounting on the Dragon Burner. So four points is more rigid than two and would allow us to do, um, allow us to do uh, input shaping without having to use a nozzle ADXL. It's really convenient to have an ADXL built into your tool head. Um, that's why I'm very excited for the upcoming Oh, what is it? Um, Beacon. The newer version of Beacon has an ADXL built in, and that's really nice because that's something you mount right next to your tool head, or right at the bottom. It should be rigid, and it's a good, good design. There we go. So I'm just gonna print this off on the V0. Got a new Stealth Burner print to install. Watching your stream. Awesome. I like Stealth Burner. I like how it looks, and honestly, it's not really a bad extruder or a bad Hanen. Uh, clockwork can be hit or miss, I feel. So if you're gonna use a stealth burner, I would strongly suggest looking into, looking into the um, uh, uh, Galileo 2, if you wanna do a whole, a uh, whole thing. Uh, oh, self changer, okay, cool, cool. So, I think there's been a little bit of confusion on this project, and that is, due to the stealth changer versus tap changer versus um, tap changer light. So I'm just gonna go over that real quick for those who are just starting on the series or uh, might have fallen asleep halfway through, which is typical, that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, all right. So we have two different repositories, okay? So number one is the main repository that's called Tap Changer. Tap Changer was originally developed with a linear rail. Let's see, is that shown down here? Uh, no. So Stealth Tap Changer was originally installed with a linear rail and the rail itself would dock into the tool. Thank you, Randy, for the subscription. Um, but some people didn't like that because there are some you know, so there's a chance that if you're not lined up properly, uh, the balls can fall out. Yeah, it's, it's tap but backwards. So instead of being locked at the bottom, it actually falls out of the bottom. It's quite a, uh, or it doesn't fall out of the bottom. It lowers. It just it allows itself to completely remove itself and dock. So that's fine. That's fine. But 
people wanted a little more robust solution. So Tap Changer Lite was introduced and that used um, these just bearings, regular bearings with different styles of, of plates or rods, whatever you want to call these things. And there's a couple different versions released. There's a plates version, a rods version, a square rods version. So there's, there's all kinds of options for this system. So this is Tap Changer Lite. Original Tap Changer uses actual linear rails. Um, this is currently the official version from the designer, which is fine. You can definitely build this. Big bearings, then smaller bearings in revision two. Okay, so it was upgraded to have smaller bearings? Interesting. Okay, all right, so this is the newer version. I thought the square plates were... Oh, are these the square plates? I, I can't even tell. Current has a smaller version. Okay, yeah, well, regardless, regardless, this is its own ecosystem. And the issue with this is if you don't have really good tolerance, you're just like a linear rail, your tolerance relies on how far away or how tight this bearing meshes into this block. So if your tolerances aren't absolutely correct for whatever reason, then you might have issues and you might have a wiggly frame or it might be too tight. So in order to get rid of all of those tolerances, there's a new version called Stealth Changer. Stealth Changer is based off a of Tap Changer, it uses the same code. It's the same ecosystem, but has a different, a different body. So this right here, and actually I just got my, I just got my, one of my things in, I got the bushings in, but this right here uses, oh, we don't have a good picture of it, do we? We need a good picture of the, of the system, but it uses uh, bushings and dowels. So we'll have three, three bushings right here, one, two, three, and the opposing part has dowels and those will go into here. And that version is both stiff, rigid, and easy to dock and doesn't rely on, you know, you have to be reasonably accurate, but it doesn't rely on, you know, very, very tight tolerances. The tolerances are not based off of the printed parts, but instead the tolerances of these factory bushings and then the, the pins that you install. So it's a very genius solution. And honestly, as soon as I saw this, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is the, this is the correct way to do this if you're going to swap tools. Now, I'm saying this, and by the time this project is completed on my end, there might be a new version, but you know, guess what? If I really wanted to, I could replace the whole entire mechanism and it would still work exactly the same. And then this is just how it docks. So it mounts up into the um, different tools. They're currently using Stealth Burner, but I'll be using Dragon Burner because I could fit more tools on here. And I think it's nice. Pezliz, thank you for the 100 bits. That's your printer docking? Nice! Nice. Yeah, uh, Pfeiffer Boy. Yes, yeah, so we have on the team, uh, Hellspark, Sin, Thessian. Ah, <laughs> I get it. Uh, BT, Pfeiffer Boy, and Pi... 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 I can't pronounce usernames. I really can't. No, no servos. So that's the, that's the key. There's no servos. It uses essentially tap. It uses the tap style of mechanism. And that's, that's what was inspired is, is tap. So that's where we're at with the, with the project. And I say we, I am sort of a beta tester, right? Cause I, I'm going to be beta testing it. Um, I will say this is all in beta until quite a few people have it, and then I'm sure it'll be officially released. But yeah, there, there's magnets that hold in, just like tap, 
Um, let me move this aside. And if you're unaware of what the heck tap is, I don't have a printer with tap yet, but I do have one with boop. Uh, let me, <laughs> this would be funny. Let me actually put this printer inside of this printer so I can show you. <laughs> yes, so the Micron 180 does fit inside of a 350 2.4. Would you look at that? Uh, so this is the boop mechanism, which is essentially tap just in a smaller form factor. So the tool head itself goes up and down. A very, very, very short travel, but it's able to go up and down. And it really wants to spring back, not due to gravity, but due to magnets. Like it's hard to hold this up. It's actually difficult. I had to put a lot of force into this to lift it. So it doesn't really want to lift until I press onto it. So when you're homing it, it'll go against the bed and the nozzle will touch, but the gantry will keep moving down until it triggers the uh, opto sensor. Op it's an optical sensor. So there's a little bit of a gap and then it detects when it's either closed or open, one of those two. And that's it. So it's super useful for getting a accurate nozzle position because it's the nozzle touching, right? Let me take this out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you want to see me convert a Micron Plus to a tool changer, um, I would also be interested in that. So. I think that'd be kind of a, a fun project. Hey, Cyber, Cyber, Cybernet? Is that how you pronounce your name? Cybernet? Oh. I should, I know, that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> all right, so first of all, I don't like how little strain relief there is on here. Hmm. What can I use temporarily to increase that. Maybe like this piece of plastic? I, I really don't know. I just want to avoid this from shifting over so much. Yeah, maybe a piece of this extrusion. Um, you could zip tie that in a couple spots. So uh, today's stream is really just going to be setting this up as a 2.4, getting it printing, and then kind of just waiting until I get all of my parts in. So while I'm installing this, I'll tell you what I'm missing currently. I am missing the pins required for essentially all of the, all the parts. Sucknet, thank you for the Prime subscription. So we're waiting on the Uh, the rest of the pins and then we're waiting on our fans so i'll probably be getting fans through fabrico i'm waiting for a restock of their 12k fans so all the fans will more than likely come from fabrico thank you k2 kevin for the 100 bits oh okay yeah i have officially uh, this heat sink is no longer useful because it keeps popping off. Remind me to order some more heat sinks. Uh. So fans um, and then cables. I am thinking of, because I don't want to make six can cables, I'd rather just buy them. The most cost efficient thing to do is to buy big tree techs. So Big Tree Tech has a CAN cable for their uh, S or what is it? The it's the Stealth Burner ones, um, SB twenty two or twenty two hundred nine, whatever their Stealth Burner boards are. They they use a different connector. They use the proper XT thirty connector. I think that's what that's called. I'm not sure. It's a different connector, and. They have a cable for that. And I'm thinking about getting six of those and then just cutting off the fat and 
installing my own uh, EBB36 compatible connector on there. So that'll all be from Fabrico. So I'm waiting on that. Thank you, Anonymous Gifter, for a sub. Uh, Steam pull is the big is the five inch big tech pie screen use drivers or is it plug and play with Clipper? Um, that's a great question. It is for the most part plug and play. Um, although I'm getting that same issue where the screen goes into like screensaver mode, and I don't know how to disable that yet. So I'm sure it's just a config I have to enable, but um, I have I have not done that yet. So. Yeah, I just worked with Clipper screen. Actually works quite nice. Uh, I was originally going to use a Manta M8P. I was going to use a Manta M8P for this build, but I realized I wouldn't be able to use a good screen on it <laughs> unless I went for an HDMI screen. And I don't like how the HDMI screens, the ports are on the side. So <laughs> I, it's just a weird setup. Um, Long story short, I went with a the stock board and the stock pie, and I'm just using one of my own uh, the five inch touch screens. Big or LGO does ship a screen. They ship the 4.3 inch. I accidentally printed the part for the five inch, so I grabbed one of my five inch screens. So if you if you know how to turn off the screensaver on that screen. Um, just put it on my Discord and I'll I'll fix it up. All right. Have you seen the the Hermit Crab? Yes, I have. I honestly don't really see a use for that. Now, if you had a two completely different styles of hot ends for whatever reason, I think it would make sense. Or if you're running a print farm, that can make sense. You have an issue, you just take it off and then install a spare head. Um, it, it could be useful, but not for me. Not for me. All right. Um, Mellow Cable has a lower profile connector, but no strain relief. Mm. Yeah, we definitely want strain relief. That's what I just did to this. I added in some strain relief to make sure this cable wouldn't be too floppy. This needs to survive a little bit. I'm just gonna cut this right now so it doesn't look too stupid. <laughs> it already looks kind of stupid, but whatever. It works, it's functional. So let me go ahead and do a home. Thank you guys for the hype train over on Twitch, very appreciated. Uh, lost connection, all right, that's fair. I probably just wiggled the pins as I was uh, messing with it. So in terms of getting everything set up, I I didn't really run into issues, actually. It was a really standard EBB36 install. I'm really used to these by now. I'm using the IO2 CAN uh, adapter for the Pi. So it's a Pi hat that gives you CAN output which is uh, pretty pretty easy to slap it on and it works. Hello Tracksman, we're doing pretty well. And thank you guys for the uh, level one hype train. Awesome. Yeah, it works pretty good. You just plug it in and it works. No configuration required as far as I'm aware. Then you just plug in your board, flash it, done. All right, let's see. So homing, let's do it. So we're going to home the X. It should stop without any issue. The Y has its um, actual physical switch. And we're using Beacon to home. <laughs> Vile Mods! Raiding in with a party of 15. Welcome on in. Vile Mods builds Nerf Blasters over on Switch. So make sure to check them out if you're interested in that. Uh, how are you How are you doing today? We are recording a stream for YouTube right now, so let me know what you are working on. Does the tool changer retain use of tap boot for Z homing? Um, 
Yes. Yes. That would kind of make sense, right? So I think it always has to have a tool docked. Uh, I haven't really looked at the code yet, but I'm pretty sure you always have to have a tool docked. Otherwise, it really wouldn't work. Uh, Vile Mods doing some 3D modeling to make a blaster chain chain feed. Ooh, that could be chain fed. That could be fun. Yeah, I can't wait to build my own 3D printed blaster. I actually have a kit from West 3D that I'm gonna be building uh, probably once this build is done. After a few of the projects are more or less done. Tap changer, tap changer light, or something else. Well, we're going to be using Stealth Changer, as I mentioned previously, which uses pins and bushings instead of bearings or a linear rail. But they all work identical. They just, you know, this, it has the same docking procedure for every single type. It's just how it, how it connects is different. Uh, yes, I'll show that later on stream but I did get that printed. All right, so that is the quad gantry level. And then I can just do a quick, uh, after doing a quad gantry level, make sure to rehome your Z because your Z offset has changed. Always remember to do that. Uh, now let's do a quick height map. I'll show you that. So this is the cool feature of Beacon and why you might want to install on your printer or I guess any type of the new eddy current style probes, you're able to kind of scan the bed. It takes a reading of the bed really quickly in the same amount of time it would take you to do a standard like, wow, I don't know, five by five bed mesh. It's able to do, this is a 20 by 20 for reference on a 350 printer. So that's really nice to have. And right now we do have a bit of a, uh, I guess a, a, a bow. Now this is with the bed not preheated. This is also not enclosed, so this might change. It might not. I'm not sure. Uh, I posted on Twitter what you know what this might be. And besides the the gantry racking, I'm not really sure what to check. So. Um, I'll keep it like this for now. It's only at around point, point 0.2. It's not ideal, but I'm not going to be printing edge to edge on here. Like every print's not going to be 350 millimeters. Um, and this is very compensatable. Remember, this is one layer, layer height. Pretty, pretty reasonable, but it could be better. Uh, I messed with the bed screws. I completely removed them. It, this is kind of the profile. It's in the gantry, I think. So we'll keep it as like this for now. I might get a lightweight, a lightweight X eventually. So that'll replace the, that middle blue beam with a lightweight beam. Uh, might actually be useful to get faster Z movement, but I don't know yet. Well, we'll see. This is a work in progress. Uh, yes, if you're, um, if you're interested, there is a discord link for the uh, Voron Tool Changer Discord. So make sure to join that if you want to get better, better answers than what I can answer for you. So that's where we're at. We can home, we can do a bed mesh. Um, we haven't installed the PEI yet. So let's, let's do that first. Do the easy stuff first and then we'll mess around with this, the wiring config. So I'm going to raise this up uh, all the way. Let's bring it to like 250. See you later. And I'll grab the magnet here. Now we're going to do this not 100% proper. I don't think there's a, there's some recommended ways of doing this, but then there's just ways of doing it. So this is one of the ways of installing a PEI sheet. Uh, before we install this, you notice that I installed this bed onto the printer without the PEI. Number one, 
It's actually easier in some situations to install the bed on first. So the bed's kind of on a solid platform, then you can install your, your uh, magnet. Um, this is especially true for the 2.4 where the bed is attached to the frame. It's really nice. Uh, number two, you can probe your bed to see if there's any issues. So as we previously saw, there might be some, um, you know, some issue in the gantry where it's just slightly bowed or causing a little bit of pressure. Something is slightly off somewhere. So it could be the bed, it could be the gantry, but it's important to note that uh, I'm actually going to save that height map that I remember. I'm going to save that. So I'm hitting save on this bed match we just did. I'm going to save this as metal. Um, let me delete the old one I got. And then I'm going to save, rename this from default to metal by renaming and then doing save config. It's now storing a bed mesh that's, um, that's called metal. You can call it bed, you can call it whatever, but this is my, my stock. This is the stock bed mesh before anything else. It's important to note that before you go further. So if I was to install this printer and I saw this, I might think, oh, well, I might need to adjust um, something or whatever, but that's just what it is. So I'll try to fix that in the future, but for now we're gonna leave it alone and then just work with it. All right, next we are going to clean everything. So there's two things to clean. Number one, um, you wanna wipe down the, the surface right here. You don't have to use dish soap, whatever. Just use some isopropyl alcohol, dump a bunch off or on and just you know, try to remove as much, as much junk as possible. It comes with a, anything that comes with a pre-applied protective coating will have some residue on it. So you'll wanna make sure to at least, bare minimum, wipe it down with some isopropyl alcohol and kinda, you know, reduce the amount of uh, a gunk on here. So I can already see that, see the black on here? You don't want that. You don't want that. So give it a good scrub, uh, especially in the corners. That's the most important part where you might be holding it. Hit all of the sides, all the corners to get as many of those nasty fingerprints off. And I like to do it twice. So flip it, flip the, I use blue shop towel. So flip that around and then do it again. You're just getting started 3D printing. Is the Ender 3 Max Neo a good choice? That is a great question. Um, I'm currently, uh, because it is gonna be 2024, I am recommending printers that have automatic Z offset. So there are a few printers now that have that. Um, the Ender 3 version 3, Ender 3 V3 SE is a very basic printer, but does come with that um, nozzle, uh, automatic nozzle calibration and automatic bed loving, etc. There's a few others. I have an any co any cubic Cobra Neo two, something like that back here. It does the same thing. All right. So that's what I recommend, but feel free to join my discord. We can have, uh, more discussions on that offline. The second thing I like to clean when installing a PEI is the magnet itself. Thank you for the follow. Um, again, flip this around to a clean-ish side. I like to just reuse it. Why not? Clean-ish side. And you want to clean the bottom of here because you're touching it with your hands. It'll have the same oils, so you want to make sure to have as little, as little oil in there as possible. It's not super critical to get it. Uh, sanitize, etc. Just make sure that it is, for the most part, free of dust and debris and any minor oils. Um, just like that. Good enough. Good enough. All right. Next thing. Um, this is still attached. Now that we have it cleaned, you want to handle it by the edges. I recommend that. Uh, I still have the PEI on top of it. 
Let me put that over here for now. Uh, link for Discord. Um, I have that in chat. Can someone send the send the link to the Hedgehog Makes Discord? So what I like to do, and maybe I can zoom in on this. This is just what I do. Is take this magnet and then set it down. We've cleaned both the surfaces, so it's fine. Set it down, and note if it overhangs at all. So note if the magnet is bigger than the bed. In this case, the magnet is ever so slightly bigger than the bed. This might vary. You might actually have a magnet that's smaller than the bed, but just kind of note how it's going to sit. So I am going to have it, because it overhangs on all sides, I'm going to have it kind of flush with the front. I'm going to make this front really nice and then try to get it even. So to do that, I'm going to start with the front of the bed. Uh, previously, I've started with the back of the bed, but I think starting with the front is even better. So you want to peel off the whole front a little bit, if I can, without damaging the magnet. Good. What is this kind of magnet? Uh, it's a standard magnet. All right. So do not touch the sticky part. If you can. Don't touch it with your hands. And then peel. Uh, it's kind of hard to do in a printer. <laughs> it's, it's a little awkward. Peel it back a little bit like this. And you're just going to focus on the front. So make sure to get this very, very front on the edge. I like to kind of guide it with my fingers. You know, feel one of these corners and make sure that it's in the right position. Kind of like, kind of like that. And then kind of work my way down and make sure that this side is also uh, on the right position. And just, you're barely pressing down on it. You're not really adhering it yet. You're just aligning it. So that side looks fine and that side looks fine. And you can run my finger down and make sure that it's exactly where I want. Now that it's just barely on there, I can lower this a little. Now that's on there, you want to work from the front to back. Think about, think about it like applying a phone protect screen protector. So start in the middle and just use your finger, use your fingers and then go back and forth. Just like that. And then you're going to work your way to the back of the printer. So make sure you have a couple of inches done. So you're just kind of going back and forth across and then working way back. And then you're going to want to lift this up and then grab this, grab the, the sheet and pull it back. So pull it back with one hand and then work your way back like this. So this is the easiest thing to do. No tools required. Then you're putting a fair bit of pressure on here too, as you're doing this. Okay. So it's important that the middle is the most pressed in. You'll focus on the sides later, but just get the, the whole thing pressed on front to back. Do not take the whole thing and just go right onto here. That's the worst thing you could possibly do because uh, you'll create air bubbles and air pockets and air pockets make bumps and bumps make inconsistent first layers. Uh, all right. So just making sure it's still aligned and it is. If you've gotten this far and it's not aligned, well, it should be aligned enough. <laughs> doesn't have to be perfect, but you should be trying to get it as good as possible. All right. Almost done here. Now what you can do is use a laminate roller to really adhere it. Um, it's just kind of a, a rubber roller that you would use it to press down, but you can use your hands. Nothing wrong with that. So use a little bit of force and we're almost done here. When I get to the end, I just remove, remove the sheet altogether and then just slowly work my way. Just continuing back until we hit this back right here. All right. Now that we have all of this 
flat, we can feel it. No bubbles, feels really smooth. We wanna make sure that all of these sides are pressed down. This is a, a pressure sensitive material, um, the adhesive. So we need to physically press it in for it to adhere. We can't just lay it down. So, you know, work, work your fingers and just kind of press all of these sides down. Just like that. Just make sure it's really adhered. And then, you know, you should have already had this kind of set correctly. And this would be the step where you take a laminate roller and really get in here and roll it. Don't use that. It has to be really smooth. You don't want to scratch this. You don't want to scuff it up. So there we go. Use a ruler to pull the paper back. Yeah, you can do that too, but you really want to make sure that you're, you're putting a lot of pressure into here, a ton of pressure. So there we go. We have our magnet installed. And for our purposes, this is good enough. Good enough. How do you feel about using glass for your bed and putting a magnet spring seal on top? Um, interesting thing about that. My original big printer was the Simple Core 330. I had a, a glass bed with a heater on the bottom and a PEI sheet on top. And the way they had it mounted just wasn't, it wasn't thick enough. So it was causing a lot of flex and that flex translated into the print. As soon as I replaced that same exact setup with a, actually put a, um, a V2 bed on top, I just laid it on top, it fixed all my problems. So I really don't like glass beds for that. Um, now you can put a glass bed on top of one of these and that will give you a flat surface. But the best thing to do is to get a giant, well, a thick, a really thick metal, Bed, a Mike Six bed. That'll be the the only real way of, um, or the best way of having a, a fixed bed that's not held on with clips, but also provides a nice flat surface. And you can get these beds super super flat as well. The LDO beds are very good. Um, this is an LDO bed. Comes with a pre-applied heater. I like them quite a bit. All right, so now we have the magnet and I'm just gonna put on the uh, sheet. Now, note that these have a, uh, all the smooth sides of PEI sheets will come with a covering. Make sure to remove this. Your prints will not stick to this. You'll find out real quick. Uh, I also have not washed this yet. Uh, actually, does this have one on? Should. Yeah, it does. Has a layer, so you see. See, see this? Yeah. Um, there you go. Make sure that's off. I'm sure some people are screaming at home like, wait a minute, is that why nothing's sticking to my bed? Yeah, that's the reason. Wow, that's a strong magnet. Oof. Very strong, perfect. All right, so make sure to only touch these at the sides if you can help it. You kind of, a you know, use it like a record or hold it like a record. And there we go. PI sheets on. Done. That's the bed. That was the easy part. I guess we'll procrastinate a little bit more. Uh, Shrimp Father, thank you for the follow. That one's smooth to one side. Yes, the LDO beds are textured to one side and then they come with a smooth on the other side, which is what I recommend. Um, you always want the ability to print on a smooth side if you absolutely need it. And then the textured side usually gives a bit better adhesion. Uh, and it actually looks like, you know, the bottom of your print. It's kind of awkward when one side of your print is smooth and the rest of them are all kind of textured. Oh well. Hey, it's a great time to talk about special sheets. So this right here is a PEO sheet. It's a little undersized because this is for a um, a 300 bed, or sorry, 350 bed. This is actually a 355 bed. So when you're buying a PEI sheet for your 350, it's actually 355. It's a little bit wider. And then when you align your zero zero point, it's going to be inset on the bed a little bit, not right on the edge. Little little details. So 
Uh, I can actually remove the covering. Again, this is a technically a smooth sheet and the texture is applied very precisely that it looks like a cool pattern. So with this type of sheet, you can actually print on it and then it'll imprint the design onto it. It's super cool and your prints will have that effect on there. So here is a, a logo I did for the Z and Z show, uh, which is my show on Monday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern time over on Twitch with Pezlas. So that is, that was printed on my bamboo and then it transfers that pattern onto it. It even transfers the kind of iridescency of it, effect of it. They're very cool. And there's all kinds of these sheets. So I'll have a link to where you can find these sheets in the video description. I strongly recommend checking them out and they're fun. They're just fun to play around with. They're not going to have as good adhesion as your nice plate, but hey, they're fun. And they're still pretty practical. I printed off a whole violin, no, not violin, uh, uh, ukulele, one of these things in ABS. And it looked pretty cool. Don't have that anymore. Gave that away. Uh, so far, it's been pretty durable. Unless you actually, you never want to use a metal scraper in here. Use one of K2 Kevin's um, printable scrapers. Those will make it last a lot longer. So we're not going to be using this for now because we want to make sure we have uh, proper adhesion. Uh, this does have a second side that is textured PEI, if you're wondering. So one side PEI, the one side PEO. Uh, the LDO bed is noticeably thicker. The, the actual spring steel in it is thicker. It's a lot heavier, so that's going to be nicer. It also should have a slightly better hold onto the magnet. Uh, yes, Chainsaw Squirrel. <laughs> so let's do the same the same test where we run a bed mesh and see how it looks. I haven't really fully calibrated my Z offset. I kind of just got it close, close enough with Beacon. And yeah, typically for all my beds, I do, I'm not going to really call it cheating. I would call it assisting, but I use Maker's Mistress. Maker's Mistress is a bed adhesive product by West 3D. And it's a combination of uh, essentially a liquid glue stick and isopropyl alcohol. So you apply it on your bed. Once the alcohol evaporates, you're left with glue stick. And it makes a nice, you can't even tell it's on there. It's a nice surface, uh, parts tend to stick better onto it, especially small parts. <laughs> and uh, it's worked very, very, very well for me. And if you do find that you applied too much and it's leaving some like white residue, you can hit it with a heat gun and it'll just evaporate. It's really cool. Okay. So let's do another QGL. Always do a QGL on a 2.4, even if you didn't change anything, uh, because if it had the chance of moving a little bit, if you go to do a bed mesh with Beacon, it will tear apart the build plate. I have a build plate, a 350 build plate actually, that I, I tore apart because I it was tilted a little, then I did a bed mesh, and then yeah, that was bad time. All right, so that is QGL, and we're gonna do another Z. All right, so the Z offset is set. Now we can do a bed mesh. All right, 20 by 20 bed mesh using Beacon. And all the cables just kinda, I'm sure someone's yelling, cable manage your hot end, cable manage. Yeah, I know, we're gonna get there. <laughs> we wanna get this printing today, so. That's part of it. In fact, while it goes, I'm gonna tear off a adapter I made from this printer. Simple Core always gets salvaged parts from. Sorry. Let me rip off. 
off this. Unfortunately, the EBB36 only has one fan port. It's designed, I don't even know what it's designed for, to be honest, but it's not designed for tool heads with two cooling fans. And you can kind of hack it and use another port, but uh, I prefer to just connect them both to my fan port. We'll get a seal with those wires. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> I actually serialize it uh, as a 2.4 before I, before I convert it. I might actually do that. Uh, so what I like to do is make a splitter cable. I don't know if you can buy these, but this is a splitter cable. It has a standard JST XH on one end, and then female. These are inline locking connectors. Uh, I love these things, and I gotta get more of them. But they allow you to just take a stock fan, uh, which I can't get here, a uh, a stock fan cable like this, and then plug it in the right way. And then it locks, has a little bit of a click. So these are super useful. And I've just taken some wire. This is the Lineo FEP wire from KB3D. I love this stuff, it's super easy to work with. And if you don't have um, spare wire, definitely pick some up from KB3D. I have a, a link down in the video description if you wanna check them out. But the Lineo FEP crimps perfect. And now I can just take, move this up a little. I can take this adapter and, uh, let me kill my motor so I can move this around manually. Uh, the bed mesh looks very similar if you're wondering. It's very similar to just probing the, uh, the previous one I did. All right, let's move this up and unlock the motors so we can work on this. go. So this little adapter right here will plug into the fan port. There is one fan port on the EBB36. Um, I will figure out which one it is because they're not labeled. Uh, EBB36. What style of printer is it where the Z has a fixed height? Z has a fixed height. Mm, um, Rephrase that question. Let's see, V36, where is the pinout? All right, um, so it goes thermistor, fan one, fan two. Uh, so, let's see. Which one is which? <laughs> fan one, fan two, where's the actual pinout for this thing? Come on, Big Tree Tech. Uh, oh, it, it's on there. I'm just missing it. So PAO, PA1. So let's look at the machine real quick and just verify. So I'm using the stock config for the uh, EVB. So I'm just going to go down to the, the fans. So it has the hot end fan right here and then fan. Just fan and clipper is the tool head fan. So that is PAO. PAO on the manual is fan one. So fan one is our hot end fan, and then fan fan two is our part cooling fan. Oops. So we're going to hook this up to fan two. And then plug in our our two cooling fans. Right now I'm just using some Fabrico um, 9200 fans or whatever they are. Those work pretty well, but I am looking to add the, the faster 12K fans for maximum performance. I print a lot of PLA, so I like Dragon Burner because you can have two fans and if you can get, re you can get really powerful uh, 4010s, ones that are 
as powerful as regular 5015s. So this is honestly all you really need for cooling, for printing most things. Now when you get Goliath level extrusion speeds, then you'll have to bump it up, but this is fine for most people. So, yeah, this is, this is called a flying gantry, because the gantry itself goes up and down with a fixed bed. And then, uh, I don't know what the trident style is called, honestly, fixed gantry. So flying gantry versus fixed gantry. Bed, they call it bed dropper. I had one zip tie that I missed. Take that off. All right, next thing we're gonna have to do, I'm just gonna power off the printer because we're gonna start doing some wiring and I recommend turning off your printer when you do wiring. This is the Sani check. Oh, and our little PCB thing finished, cool. So let's see if this just fits by laying it over. This is the adapter right out of the uh, Chirpy's uh, repository for Dragon Burner. But I'm not sure if this one will fit with this specific configuration. Let's see. Um, yeah, this is... Will it fit? I think it lines up perfectly. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do is remove the PCB. The, the printer is off now. Remove that. Save the screw. Pretty cool. It comes with black screws, so it'll match the rest of the printer. I don't like mix and matching screws, <laughs> just for aesthetics. All right, so take this off, and then we can, uh, while we have it off, might as well install our heater wires. Now, a stock, a stock printer will have pre-crimped ferrules, and these generally do not fit into an EVB36. So what you want to do. Uh, is actually cut them. You'll need to cut them for an EBB 36. And then you can tin them or you can use a much smaller connector. I don't know if these are correct, but you'll have to use a smaller connector in order to um, put them on. So we're just going to cut, cut these off and then strip them back. That's typically what I do. Just be very careful to make sure that all of your stranded wires are going into the the port. Your gut would say moving only the bed up and down would be the best route. So this has been a very, you know, very debated topic on whether you should have a fixed gantry or a fixed bed. Fixed bed is better for big parts. Fixed gantry is better for small parts. Because with this style, it doesn't matter how big your your part gets. It'll have no impact on the, the performance of the printer. As you print a super, super big part on something like a Trident, it will start to weigh the bed down more and that can potentially have an impact. That being said, something like a Trident is designed for uh, pretty heavy loads. So it's generally not an issue. I think you can probably fill up the entire bed with a printed part and it would still print the same. Probably uh, subscribing on YouTube. Thank you. How big are we talking? Well, I've generally been recommending when you're going for a 350 printer to go for a 2.4. That's kind of where I, I like to have that limit because the bed itself starts to get really big and heavy. And that's a lot of weight on the lead screws. And the lead screws will start wearing down uh, quicker over time. And if you're talking about an integrated lead screw, uh, that's a lot of money to replace. Those are like $30 each, the whole, the whole set. So it's about $100 to replace lead screws, you know, all your lead screw steppers in your printer. So the bigger the bed, uh, the more stress you're going to be putting on your your lead screws, and that's kind of the limiting factor. So 300 and under, very safe to go with a Trident style. Um, but, you know, you can still do a, 
a 350 Trident and be fine. Thank you for the lurk. If you're lurking. All right. I gotta take take these little mini terminals. The EBV 36 and Big Tree Tech is so close to being perfect. It is so close. I really like it. It's super easy to configure. Um, but the fact that they're using these tiny little terminal blocks for the heater wires, and they only have one fan output, and they're using a really bad connector for this style of mount. Uh, I think it's a Molex four pin. It's, you know, so close. I think the Mellow boards have all of those things, like the SHT boards. I think those have most of those things fixed. But um, yeah, I'm hoping that the Big Tree Tech boards, the future standalone boards, the non stealth burner ones, will have those improvements. But then they made the SB2040 like have really small connectors, something like that. <laughs> Always so close, so close. But hey, let's see if this will work. Uh, I just did a brief test and it did look like it lined up. Another zip tie. Can never have enough zip ties. Zip ties are almost free, use them. Cut them off, we don't need them. So it does look like this will fit, perfect. So this mounts onto two little screws on the bottom as well as the two for the uh, on the standoffs so i'll make a nice nice and secure mount and we can actually do an adxl test on it because of that so that'll be fun we get to see how jank our printer is let me know in the comments below do you think this will be have a really good input shaping graph do you think it'll have a bad input shaping graph? Do you think it'll be bad because we're using the built-in ADXL on the, the tool board? Let me know what you predict. And then go back after and edit and then leave a response to that. <laughs> Hashtag engagement. <sighs> now let's see, I need to screw into those. I need some more very short M3s. Um, all I got are these button heads hmm, that are black. I guess I'll use socket heads. What will be the downside of flying gantry? Downside of a flying gantry. So with a fixed gantry, everything's a lot more rigid because it's fixed. Right now, we're on a, you know, the whole gantry is floating, so it has some amount of play back and forth. It should be mostly rigid, right? Like the way we have it mounted. But it's not going to be as rigid as bolting this gantry to the frame. That's the biggest downside, is that your, your printer is only as rigid as this gantry itself. Luckily, the 2.4 is pretty well designed. And the gantry is taken off of a trident. So it just just kind of works. Oh, I forgot heat sets. Oh boy. Um, okay, I can install those after the fact. Oops. Remember to do your heat sets before you install parts in your printer. Make it a little bit easier. So in terms of Trident versus 2.4, I like them both. I don't really see a difference in the performance of either, but I kind of like how the 2.4 has a fixed bed. So all your parts are fixed to the frame. If you need to remove a part, you can just yank on it without worrying about, you know, the bed moving or anything like that. And it's nice to have the part not move at all. It's easier to see if there's issues, especially if you're using something like Z-Hop, where the, you know, the bed would be consistently moving. It's nice to really be able to stare at a print. I think it's better for time lapses too. But you know, eh, very, very minor differences. 
All right, let's put some heat sets on this part. Once again, if you're looking for the files, um, this is the Dragon Burner series of parts. There's all kinds of stuff, including um, extended mounts like what we have here. This is a non treated near non stock mount. We're actually using a MGN 12 mount. Remember, this is a tool head for a V0 uh, that enough people requested be modded onto. Uh, oh, actually, is this? Ah, shoot. Was I supposed to put this on the other side? All right, I think I was. So I lied. I'm going to take this off because the heat sets go in from the other side. Oops. It's only a couple screws. Anyway, yeah, this this hot end or this tool head was very popular due to its size and the ease of printing. It's like three parts. That's it. I I prefer this over Zoll because Zoll uses a lot of unique fasteners. Like they use M2 fasteners and stuff. And they also uh, have a smaller less common hot end fan that's really loud so even just having a 30 10 blower as your hot end fan uh, is nicer than the 25 10 fan on Zoll. i use Zoll. i think it has good performance uh, it's mostly for printing abs though the the fan profile is more optimized for abs do you use the orbiter or galileo so when i am looking to just Put an extruder on my printer 99% of the time I go for Orbiter 2 um, and I think that will remain the same until I find another another tool or another extruder that is as high performance as the Orbiter so large gear in Orbiter's case I call it like a medium gear extruder where the drive gears are slightly bigger than BMG so they have better overall uh, consistency, you know, less extruder artifacts. It's a very, very, very clean printing extruder. That's also powerful enough to push reasonably fast. Something like the Hextruder, Hextruder the printer or the tool head from the uh, Hevort project or VZBot, uh, is it VZBot? No, oh, I think it was originally um, Keyboard, who developed it, Mirage C. But that's a pretty good extruder, and I've used that before. I like it. I like how you can manually feed the filament by twisting the drive gear. With Orbiter, there's no way of doing that. It's all enclosed. Uh, as a plus side, Orbiter, you'll never get your stuff dirty inside because it's all contained. Yeah. Pros and cons of everything. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that they release a smart Orbiter 3. Oh, that's right. This is the one where it doesn't quite line up properly. I remember that now. I'm uh, hoping that they eventually release a, a smarter Orbiter 2. Like a smart Orbiter 3, but without the hot end. Because I want a built-in filament sensor. I mean, if we can have clog detection inside of the extruder, that would be so good. Hey, still much research. Yeah, I still think there's a lot of advancements to be made in extruders. So many more advancements, and I'm very excited to, you know, I'm excited to see what's going to come out next. Hot ends, they've more or less hit their peak. There's not a whole lot you can do to, you know, increase the hot end now. Um, just overall better mounting, uh, more reliable heating cores, etc., etc., etc. So I think we'll see kind of the peak, not the peak, but diminishing returns. That's a good word for it. Diminishing returns in 2024. That's just an estimation, though. I obviously don't know the future. 
You like the filament runout sensors. I don't really care about filament runout. I care, I mean, I, I do, but I like filament clog detection. Um, AKA smart encoder detection. So it'll detect that the filament's moving versus if it's just there or not. So the Big Tree Tech Smart Sensor has that feature, and I've been using that on the V0. And once you have it set up correctly, it does, does work. Ironically, put it on the V0, mostly because it was very easy to install, and I'm using it as a testing platform right now. But yeah, it does detect when the filament stops moving. You just gotta increase the, the range so it doesn't trip if a speck of dust hits it. Cool, now that's mounted. And now we don't need this whole entire thing that I put on here because we can just zip tie it to here. All that for kind of nothing, but oh well. Giving you options. This is just some extra cable cover anyway. LGO includes quite a bit of it. So that's this stuff right here that goes inside of a channel. Uh, on the back right here, there's one of these covers that kind of contains the, the B motor wire. Cool. What's next? Um, before I forget, let's add some zip ties to here. I made some suggestions for these mounts, so I think they're going to be revised in the near future. So stay tuned for that. But I really like how the the whole entire Dragon Burner setup works with their extra mounts in the bottom. Makes it easy to, to mount a board like this rigidly or anything else you might want to put on. So there we go. I have that zip tied here. Now we have proper strain relief. That's what you want. It's a little high, but... I think it's perfectly fine. So that'll make sure the wire is always upright and that the connector isn't absorbing the, the load as I break one of the cables. Should probably use larger cables for these, but the small ones that come with the printer are fine for now. Try that again. Okay. So that's that. Good, good. Um, next is the thermistor. I think I've already, yeah, I already have this wired. Um, so I have a, a plug for the, uh, right now we're just have, we've installed a Revo. Cause that's, <laughs> I just had it laying there. Already in the Dragon Burner mount and I was able to just go, whoop, all right, now we're using this. With Dragon Burner, you can just print one part to change out a hot end. So it's nice to just have a, you know, an extra set of parts. This one is for a dragon, for example. So if I had a dragon or a dragon, uh, um, dragon length hot end, like those $20 hot ends I'll be using for this build, I'll just be able to pop it on there. V2 is your first experience with Canvas. Do you want Canvas on your V2 instead of Pico Bilical? Is there a reason for that? I think it's a good option. I'm just kind of curious what your reasoning is behind there. But yeah, CAN bus is not okay. CAN bus itself is kind of weird. When I'm talking about CAN bus, I really mean like a tool head PCB. I think in the future we'll start seeing more USB based ones instead of CAN based, which will make configuration so much easier. So much easier no need for all these adapters and weird things but for now you know these can tool headboards are sufficient we'll see how well six of them perform though oops I got the wrong thing. but that'll be very interesting to see oh you meant pico bilical okay all right that's that yeah pico bilical is the stock kind of umbilical remote tool head board but P uh, Pico Bilical uses a one-to-one -one system where each pin 
corresponds to one pin. In this setup, we have only four cables for the whole entire tool head. Two power and then two data. Okay, right now I'm just kind of cable managing this mess. My little fan Y adapter is causing some overage, so I'm just going to tie that down. And is there anything else? We got two fans. We have thermistor and heater. We have our extruder as well. The probe is run separately. It's run through a USB cable. So I think we're ready. We're ready. Let's see if I can throw on a couple more cable management uh, zip ties though. I should have done this first, but there's some slots in the back of the, uh, right back here. See those two slots on each side right here and right there. Those are zip tie slots. You'll want to run your two sets of cables up the sides and then zip tie them off. That's a, that's a good solution, but I don't know if I'll be able to easily uh, do that. Let's see. Again, I should have done this first. I can just take off the cover if I really need to. Oh, there we go. I'm able to press it through and pull this. Remember, if you like this type of content, make sure to like the video and subscribe to my channel over on YouTube. I've been enjoying these builds. I've done many, many printer builds like this, but I'm starting to just kind of change up how I'm recording them for YouTube. So I'm recording live on Twitch. We'll usually have an after party as well. So after the recording is over, we'll hang out for a bit and talk about random stuff, kind of Q&A, etc. During this portion of the stream, I like to focus just on the build. So if you're watching in the future, it's mostly about this build or um, relevant Q&A questions. Keyword is relevant. After the stream, we can talk about whatever. Some interesting topics come up, so it's worth watching live if you can. And thank you to Nero earlier for the shout out. He's also a, uh, a very popular printer builder. Let's see. Just want to get this wired up now. Uh, I like to generally test stuff before cable managing, but I'm not going to, you know, jinx myself here, but I think we'll be fine. Uh, knock on, knock on mousepad. Just want to make it sure everything is kind of contained. So it's a lot nicer than what it was. If you see the before and after, you get a much better appreciation. And speaking of being live on Twitch, shenanigans, thank you for the raid. Welcome on in. Lateral, uh, yeah, you're in a, a central time. <laughs> yeah, most people usually work during the week, so it's kind of hard to stay up late and watch these streams. And a lot of people are in Europe too. So I'm apologizing if you can't you know, find a time to watch my streams, but hopefully now that I'm recording stuff like this, you'll be able to go on YouTube after the fact. So this is our final wiring for this setup. This is not, this is not specific to this printer. You can do this on any Boron printer. So you can put on your Trident, your 2.4, um, even your V0 with, you know, you don't, we don't have the probe on there, but similar mount, right? It actually just mount right to your stock V0. You put a tool headboard in the back. Um, there are mounts for a legacy if you're building a legacy, but that's, if you're building a legacy, you know, you know what's up anyway. So let's get this powered on and see if it blows up. No smoke yet. Good. And uh, shenanigans, what were you streaming today on Twitch? I think you're working on like a jet engine or something. Turbine. Really cool. Oh, I'll also show you a couple cool things while this is booting up. God, it's so heavy. I need a, I need a turntable. 
The issue with turntables, though, is that they're, you know, they spin where you don't want them to. Lazy Susan type of thing. Um, on the bottom of the printer here, you will see that we have a screen. And this screen has a really cool mount. It's a very, very beefy mount. And it has these, uh, what did I click? Um, it has these little accents that you can print out and glue in place. At least I think they glue, because maybe they snap in place with an adapter. But I glued mine, it worked out fine. I used some 3D glue, ABS. Uh, so that goes on like that. I still have this screen protector on. So now that we know that everything works, let's do a peel. Ready? Is this even focused on the screen? Yeah, there we go. Woo, fresh screen. Yeah, look at that. Beautiful. And then to go along with that screen, the same designer, which I'll, if I remember, I'll post the link in the video description. Let me know, bug me if I don't. But they have these custom mesh skirts. So these are the two color skirts that we'll be using. I'm using black and dark gray from Polymaker, both galaxy colors. But these ones are custom. Um, instead of doing just the layer change modifier, these are designed um, to be printed like this. So no messing around with modifiers. You just import them into your slicer and then print. So I like this and I think I'll be using these for my printers. Uh, if they have a Trident version, that'd be awesome. But yeah, this is designed for this right here. So that goes on uh, right here. Even more that goes on right right here of course it'll fall down but that'll look like that uh, oh I don't have my light on today just turn that on that goes like that and then that one goes on the other side and it goes around the whole printer so I think that'll be a really good look I love those mesh skirts as well you'll poke your fingers through the stock skirts are too open in my opinion so any of these mesh skirts are cool. All right, let's get this set up like this and almost ready to print, believe it or not, almost ready. All right, Shenanigans is working on the turbine. Awesome, awesome. Check out Shenanigans 3D over on Twitch. So let's see if the tool head, let's see if we can get the everything to home first that's the the first step and then we'll go back and edit stuff so a little bit of a pro tip if you're working on a flipper profile and you don't let's say you don't have your bed connected and it throws an error because you don't have a thermistor well you can completely calm out comment out your bed section and then any relevant fans that use heaters and it'll just ignore it. So you can use your printer, you know, as is to get set up, test, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's what I had to do for this. I, instead of disabling the bed, I disabled the extruder. So let's re-enable the extruder. That's our first goal. So if the homes, I'm sure it'll work fine. I didn't really change anything. So let's go into the clipper config and, oh, that's not clipper thing. That's me. Hi. My little hedgehog. I love this thing. Thank you for sending this over. Really, really awesome. Lives on my V0. And I actually used my V0 today to print out a couple parts for this printer. Uh, the two blue parts, there was the film that I had loaded. I just printed them on the V0. In fact, I still have the Screw it on there. Eh. It's a, it is a nice little fast prototype machine. The bamboo is also nice, but it takes so long to start a print that a two minute print takes 20 minutes. It's ridiculous. <laughs> oh well. All right. Machine, printer dock config. Let's start editing. So we do not need our extruder. In fact, I'm just gonna delete this altogether. We're not using our extruder motor. We're not using anything. So I'm just going to delete it to clean up the config. I can always re-download the config if I need to. Uh, not a big deal. 
All right, let's just work on cleaning up the config a bit. I like to remove these comments too. Once it's set up, it's set up. Um, what is this? Solid state relay pin HE1. Um, there is, okay, so there's two ways of setting up your bed heater with, with an octopus. Let's see if I can pull up the manual. So octopus, um, octopus boards right here, and a lot of these other boards have different types of heaters. One, they have the bed heater. That's this right here. This is a high amperage heater designed to run a DC bed. Okay, and then you have your auxiliary heaters right here on a, a five driver board. There'll usually be two of these right here. And on a eight driver board, there's typically four. So they intend you to use multiple extruders. So one of the configs you can do is because we're using a solid state relay to run an AC bed, there is no load on the, the bed port. So what you can do is actually run your heater bed going to the relay, run it off of the HE0 port right here. And then you can run your hot end off of the, the, the bed port. That'll give you just more headroom, etc. Now, I don't think there's an issue with running your, even the, the most powerful of hot ends like Rapido, uh, etc. I don't think there's an issue with running it off of one of these. I've never run into an issue, but if you're trying to print for 10,000 hours, maybe there might be a difference, maybe. I don't know, but that's just something to note that you can do it both ways and the configuration might tell you to do it one way or another. Hey, Maker My Nexus. Can the Titan extruder be used on a uh, Dragon Burner? That is a great, that is a great question. Um, so you can confirm that by going into the repo for uh, Dragon Burner. And they should have a list of all of the available stuff. Uh, let's see, extruder support. So LGX Lite, Sharp Mini, Sharp Micro, Sailfin, Shark Fit, or Sailfin, yeah, Sailfin, Shark Fin. I'm using Sailfin on my, my uh, Micron Plus, Orbiter V1.5, V2, VZ Hextrudort, uh, Double Folded Extender, Round Trip, the Galileo 2 standalone, and then, you know, some of the other, other ones, but maybe not, maybe not. I wouldn't, honestly, I wouldn't throw a giant, you know, <laughs> extruder onto your little tiny tool head, but that's just me. Oh, bed heater, I'll delete those because we don't need it. It's PID tuned, so that's, this automatically gets comments out once you do a PID tune. I have beacon, bed mash, fan. I do not have this fan, so I'm going to, I'm gonna comment it out in case I want to set up another fan in that port for like my, you know, a skirt fan, or maybe a pie fan, etc. So I'm gonna comment that out for now. Uh, controller fan, I don't actually have hooked up yet, but that will be on PD-12. That's the Voron users GitHub. That is the Dragon Burner GitHub. Just type in Dragon Burner Voron, or just Dragon Burner into Google, and then that'll give you that whole list. Uh, LEDs, I don't have those quite set up yet, but I can delete I'm just going to delete the stealth burner LEDs because we don't have them. And then I think we'll be installing these case lights. So I'll keep that in for now. I don't have a chamber thermistor set up yet, but I'll leave it there. Safe Z home. We have more or less set up good enough for now in the middle of the bed. Um, I did have to modify this config temporarily. So I'm just gonna leave it alone for now. Quad gantry level, that is fine as is. We already modified it. Board pins are there. And then macros. So I think we're fine here. 
think we have enabled everything. Yeah. So we'll save and close that. And then on the <coughs> on the EBB36. Now I'm gonna un uncomment the extruder, because I didn't have that before. And I wanted to get it working. We're gonna leave everything as is, but we're using a we're using Orbiter 2. So I'm gonna go into my V0 config and then copy the rotation distance, which is here, and use that. Be close enough to start. I found I find the stock rotation distance is pretty much spot on, regardless of your attention. I'm watching the YouTube pods is the printer hardware built already. Um, the printer itself is more or less complete, minus the the tap changer, stealth changer specific parts. All right, so we have this. We don't have a max amplifier. Um, can I just delete this? Yeah, I'm just gonna delete this because it's not needed. I don't physically have one of these in here. And it's already defined up here. So that's fine. Max temp, we can increase that. Uh, what is the max temp of a repo? Typically, if it's a 300C hot end, I set my max temp to 310. So that way, if it's at 100, 300C, it won't air out by going to 301. So max temp 310 is fine. It'll just shut off if it goes above that. Um, extruder, we will need that. Typically for a extruder, I set the stealth chop to zero. Um, I I am not an expert when it comes to stealth chop, but um, there might be a reason to keep it enabled. There might be a reason, but for extra torque, we're gonna run it like that. On Orbiter 2, I run my currents at at least 7.5 or 0.75 amps. Our fan is set up as is. We can re-enable the hot end fan because it's hooked up to the extruder. Any time the heater goes above 50, it turns on. Uh, we don't have RGB. I don't have a BL touch. I'm just going to delete that because we don't need it. Um, I'm not going to add RGB either because, <laughs> um, yeah, not, not for now. And then we don't have a filament or motion switch. Cool. So we don't have any of that. Yeah, you can increase torque by turning off stealth chop. Um, I started with all my printers with st on stealth chop because I wanted them to be as quiet as possible. And if you're trying to get a quiet printer, then yeah, print slower, enable stealth chop, and it'll work perfectly fine. But, uh, you know, I'm just playing around and I like faster printers now, so I'm turning that off for the most part. Cool, I think we're good here. I can change the extruder to 32 micro steps as well. Although, I think 16 might be better. Hmm, not sure. What do I know? Do we need anything else? Anything else here? Hmm. Seba, thank you for the follow. No probe. I think we're good. Uh, oh, if I had a probe, you'd have to move the probe into the other config, and it would tell you that. In fact, you could take all of this right here, and then just put that into the other uh, the main printer.config right here. But some of the items, like the probe, you have to have in printer.config or else it'll yell at you. So that seemed to work. And now we have our extruder. Extruder is reading 18C. Um, does anyone know, off the top of their head, what a Revo uses for a sensor type? Canvas ID is interesting, no path names. Uh, no, we're using straight up Canvas. So we have a Canvas UU ID. We're not using it via USB. Um, hmm. I'll have to look this up real quick. Uh, let me just go over to the printer. And while you're waiting, you can look at a bed mesh. Woohoo. Maybe. Maybe it's the QGL. 
something. And Mukishi has it. Thank you. Usually chat can look up stuff faster than I can even set up my cameras to Google it. <laughs> that looks about right. So let's go into that and adjust. Yeah, so the sensor type. It's important to get your sensor type correct. It might be close enough that it has a similar reading, but it won't be accurate. So let's double check. How's the wiring going to work for all the tool heads? Ah, that's the issue. Each tool head is going to have its own umbilical cable. So in this case, I have one green cable. I'm going to need six green cables. It'll be a giant pain, but it's kind of like the XL, Prusa XL. It's kind of the same thing, right? This is going to be like a slightly better Prusa XL when we're done with it, right? Something like that. Hopefully. That's the goal. <clears throat> now I have these. These are the Mellow Fly Canvas Expanders. And I have two of them. These are unnecessary, but they will help us with the wiring. So this is what it looks like right here. Pretty much just a breakout board for the, you know, Canvas. So these two are our heater or our power connectors and then we have the CAN bus connector here. So we feed it in with power and CAN and then it just distri distributes it. And the way that CAN works is that it looks up stuff via UUID so it doesn't matter if uh, it doesn't matter if the you know everything is connected. So it's kind of cool that works. This even has a, a CAN cable. The uh, whatever port that is. It has one of those ports if you wanted to. So I'll be using, somehow connecting both of them together. I'm probably gonna connect three to this one and then take this one and then kind of jumper it over to make it nice and clean. And then we'll be able to mount this onto our DIN rail and have everything come back to that. That's the plan. So now that the sensor type is updated. Let's save and restart and then try a PID tune. Um, unknown temperature sensor. All right, let's see. So that's not the correct formatting. Let me just try 104 NT. Uh, that's not the correct uh, formatting for Clipper. Let's see. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Um. Aha. Yeah. ATC. There we go. That's the one. <laughs> Had to look it up for a second there. Thank you. Thank you. I kind of wish there was a reference document for all the different types right in Clipper. That would be useful. Cool. So now that's properly configured. Uh, same exact extruder temperature, 18.6 C. So that's fine. Now I'm going to PID tune it. Uh, let me, yeah, I'll, I'll PID tune it. Just to get a profile set up for it. And our fans are incorrect. Okay. <laughs> so I have the fans backwards. So I got to swap them. It turned on the extruder fan or the, the blower fans instead of the hot end fan. Oh, well, I thought I had it correct. Oh, yeah, no, I totally had that backwards. What was I thinking? think. Unless... Unless something's messed up. I'll try it like that. Easier to swap, flip over the connectors instead of changing the config. That way that if I have to copy and paste this config, it's the same. I, I could con con 
I could change it, but I want everything to be consistent. That's the idea. Let's try it again. There we go. If you can rewire something instead of changing config, do it. All right, so that's heating up. So while that's going on, what else do we have to do? Hmm, we need a filament holder. We're actually about to test printing in like five seconds. Oh, we need a profile too. Oh, we need to set up our, our start G code. Okay. Well, this will be easy enough. I'm just going to copy my other 2.4. Literally copy paste. Let's go into my regular 2.4. And this is my print start. Oh, I don't have camp set up yet. Shoot. We haven't done an ADXL either. Um, uh, what should I do? What should I do? We can, hmm. all right, let's do this then. I'll show you something cool. If you're in a situation like this and you have absolutely no idea what to do for your start macro. Oh yeah, I could do it after, but I don't have a purge. I'll show you something, something that's cool. All right. Here is a macro generator from zero G. This is a newer, uh, experimental um, generator and it works. I've used it. So if, I'll link this in the video description. So if you want to check it out, there you go. So you set your default nozzle temp, um, your bed temp. If you want your part cooling fan on when it's, when it's homing, um, your prime line length, the heat soaking time, if you want to. Uh, so that's useful for a printer like this. I'm going to just keep it off and not use it. Probe. Yes. Are you using the probe attached to your tool head? Uh, oh, uh, level the bed. So you can pick three point or four point leveling. So we have a quad gantry level four point bed mesh. I want to create a bed mesh before every print. And then we're using Orca slicer and that's it. Generate. We need to enable arc support in order for this to work. So we're going to copy and paste this into our config. So we're just going to put this at the very top of, um, of the config, enable arc support. This will enable G, G2 and G3 commands. It's kind of a weird thing that's not enabled by default in Clipper. So yes, that's in there now. This is our start print macro. So let's actually go into uh, into Orca Slicer and then make a new printer. So let me just select um, a three or a 250. Actually, we don't even need to do that, do we? Not really. Shoot. We don't need to. This is a Bugman cauldron if anyone's wondering. Bugman. All right, let's just go into here click to edit preset and then just rename it. So I'm going to rename my 2.4 300 as 2.4. Um, let's just name it tap changer. So I know what it is. And this is a, a 0 0.4 millimeter printer. Actually, does it even matter? Not really. Just tap changer. Uh, printable height uh, is going to be taller. I'll set it to 300, but it doesn't matter for now. And then the printable area is a good old 350 by... Not quite 350 right now. Uh, 330, but in the full printer, it'll be 350. Okay. I think that's good for the machine G-code. Uh, we have a copied and pasted... G code, so I'll just replace that. Um, this was generated from that macro. And that's it. Now I have a tap changer. Yay. Cool. So that's done. And now our clipper macro. This is our start print macro that was generated. We're going to slap that into 
wherever our macros are. If you have your own macro folder, put it there. On this case, I'm going to replace the start print macro, which is literally just start print. A little smarter. And then save and restart. Uh, actually, a few things. Uh, no, it does preheat the bed first, which is good. Um, but it homes, it homes the printer, then preheats, then homes. I guess that's fine. Just one extra step. So that's exactly what came out of the the generator. Nothing else. All right. Now we are ready to almost print. So I'm going to do a uh, a double check of the Z offset. I always like to do this. So I'm going to home the printer, QGL, then rehome the Z. And then I'm going to I'm going to triple check that the Z offset is too high. I always want my first print on a brand new printer to be too high, and then I'll use the Z offset or the baby stepping to lower it. Oh, it's looking good. I'm not sure how the cables are going to run for umbilical, but they're going to have to somehow come and then attach to this back frame. Maybe. I don't know. What? I'll, I'll wait to see. Right now it's just kind of jankly tied to this. But the tool heads are going to dock right up here. Right in the front onto this extrusion. It's kind of cool. Filament. Hmm. What am I going to do for filament? Hmm. I should have printed out a spool holder for this. I always forget the spool holders. Originally used the back piece where the exhaust part goes. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, maybe. But then that would run the wires outside of the printer. I guess that makes sense. It doesn't really matter. We can figure it out. This is not going to be your a clean printer. It's going to be kind of a, it's going to look kind of more like a Prusa XL, but we're going to put a, we're going to make a 2020 top hat for this. And I think we're going to get some custom panels for it as well. Okay. So that's homed. Let me try to find a piece of uh, paper. And then just verify. I need to like get a calibrated piece of paper or something like that. <laughs> just like a stack of paper that I can use for testing the Z offset. Yes, I know feeler gauge, feeler gauge, feeler gauge, but I still like paper. Just the physical touch the paper, something about it. Um, so let me do a a um, probe probe. Calibrate? No, it's not probe calibrate. It's beacon. Beacon. Be beacon calibrate. But before we do that, we actually need to heat up our bed. <laughs> Should have done that first. Um, let's heat up our bed to 60C. And then... <coughs> uh, wait. Wait for it to heat soak. And while that's doing that, um, I'm gonna try to set up a way to run filament. Hmm. Maybe steal it off of the 2.4 for now. No, I don't wanna do that. I need that. Filament holder that can easily just throw together. Hmm. Might use one of my standalone ones if I can quickly find that. Filament. I really need to just mount a spool holder to the ceiling. That would be optimal. Posted notes are very reliably 0 .004. All right, good to know. Uh, X1C rear mount. I don't have that installed. Hey, Thunder Fox, welcome in. Yeah, see, I always have a bunch of things until I actually need them. 
Like, I could run it out of my dry box if I really wanted to. But it's not a good setup. I don't have a good dry box with a proper filament port. Mm hmm. Hmm. Oh, uh, we'll use this. This is my little standalone K2 spool holder, I guess. And then I'll find a Bowden tube that is long enough. I think the extra from the Micron will be good enough. <laughs> a little bit extra, sure. So let's, uh, let's just push this in here. I removed a little clip that's on the extruder for orbiter. I find it's not needed. Because you can just put that in there. Doesn't matter if it goes up and down because it's reverse Bowden. Use that mount and bolt it to your shelf holes. Oh, okay. All right. You didn't think you'd be expecting getting a lulz bot working? Oh, interesting. Lulz bot, huh. Yeah, <laughs> run, it, run, it, run it from the production spool? Yeah, no. No thanks. I'm gonna run it a little less jank. Um, the issue is I like to have it physically connected to something. So what we're gonna do is kind of jank, but not too jank. Oh, 2.85 filament. Nice, nice. Just mildly jank. Let's uh, zip tie this Bowden. Zip tie this to the frame. There we go. There, so it can't really move too much. It's kind of held in place. And then we're gonna run it up into this PTFE. Um, kind of like this. Perfect. It's a cool 3D printer. I like it. I like it so far. Um, honestly, if you're gonna build a 2.4, and if you have space for it, build a 350. So far, now I haven't fully performance tested it, whatever, but so far, this thing is pretty nice. And compared to the 300, this is huge. I can do so much more with the 300. Um, sometimes, some occasions, I feel like I'm a little bit limited with the 300 2.4. You're getting more jank lately? More jank? Have you seen the cable management on this printer? It's nearly perfect. <laughs> How much is that 3D printer? Well, you can buy them from a couple different vendors. Um, I do have an affiliate account with West 3D. And right now they are on clearance on sale, I guess. Um, so if you're looking to pick one up, I think the sale ends today <laughs> or something like that. Uh, let's see, but West 3D, if you go to west3d.com slash zombie hedgehog um, and then click into the LDO kit 2.4. Um, you can go right here. There you go. You can get a in stock. Let's see if they have any. So this is the 350 2.4. Like I said, right now they are on sale. Uh, so if you're interested in buying one, I would do it now. Uh, if you're going to buy one, use my affiliate link, please. Uh, I do get a small kickback and it helps, you know, helps build up this channel. You can go gray, black, blue, or red frame. Um, I really like the blue frame, but you can get a red frame. They also look pretty cool. So typically, this build will be $1,500. $1,500 when it's not on sale, and they're not typically on sale. And that comes with a Raspberry Pi, a free Pi, a Revo Voron and a touch screen. So that's pretty awesome. And of course you can pick up extra stuff like, um, I think they have backers, backers for this. And if you want any additional parts, check out what they have under the, the two point whatever list. And if you want to self configure, self source your printer, you can go and choose every single piece in this printer. Now, if you're building a tap changer, it would actually make sense to use the configurator and you can, you know, add, remove stuff as needed. So if you don't need a part, you can do not needed. 
All right. So that's that. So thank you to West3D for, you know, helping support the channel over the, over the years. Only Kickstarter printers have backers. <laughs> oh God. Uh, you're funny. Man, this workspace has gotten a little bit messy after building a printer. I start off really clean and then I kind of just, you know, you run out of room real quick. It's just important to keep things as organized as possible. Make homes for your items if you have them. Oh, but I need to get this set up over here. What are we going to print with? What filament shall we use? Hmm. I personally like to use something that's going to show defects pretty well. Um, let's use PLA Pro Dark Gray. Perfect. This is Dark 2 Gray. It's a nice new color of PLA Pro from Polymaker. If you're looking for a, a darker gray for, I don't know, building organizers or functional parts, works pretty well for that. And you can check out Polymaker's filament on their website with the affiliate link in the video description as well. That also helps support the channel. And Polymaker filament is good stuff. All right. Yeah, dark gray. Like this is this is the ABS dark gray. Um, is it? It is right. It's, yeah, I had to actually look. This is the. This is the dark gray, and the light gray is even lighter. Actually, is that? Did I mess up here? Is that dark gray? Yeah, the light gray is even lighter. Oh, I guess when I printed on... Huh, wait a minute. Did I use the right color? What color is this? ABS... Yeah, dark gray. Huh. Yeah, it's not super, super dark. Okay. Are we ready? Are we ready to print? So let's go back to the config. And did I do a PID tune? Did I save that? I don't actually know. Let me go into machine settings and see if I saved my um, my config. Uh, heater bed. No, I didn't. I just didn't. Okay. Let's do that, I guess. Why did I stop that? I must just not have saved it. You're missing three ASA printers. It's going to take four times longer to heat the printer. The parts take to print. Yeah, that's the issue. Oh, man. Yeah, V0 right there. Perfect for that. So how are you guys enjoying this build so far? Are there any other types of builds you'd like to see in this channel in the future? Happy New Year to you, Tink Live. Thank you for stopping by. <laughs> if you build a 3D printer from scratch, does it come, pro um, come programmed? That's a great question. Typically, scratch-built printers are going to run the clipper firmware that's kind of generally used because clipper is very easy to configure for different circumstances so whether you're you know using a a stock design or you're modifying stuff clipper is generally used with clipper uh, usually printers will have a stock config so if you follow a build guide 100% accurate to to the guide and you use their clipper config, you generally don't need to change anything. And you know, it, it's somewhat pre 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 configured. But you'll still have to flash the board and overall the process isn't too bad. And I can certainly help you out when the time comes. So if you're looking to get um, even greater 
support for printers like this, I do have a Patreon. Um, I built quite a few printers and have a little bit of knowledge on it. So if you'd like me to help you with your custom build or help you with uh, other 3D printed related things, I'm certainly able to do that and would love to. So if you want to sign up for my Patreon, let me know what kind of help you need. And I heard there might be stickers in 2024. Stickers, maybe. All right, we're gonna save this config. Oh, extruder option, control conflicts with included value. Interesting. Oh, it's because my, my extruder is in a different, oh yeah. I remember that now. Okay, so here's my issue. Um, my extruder isn't actually in the same config. So what we have to do is move our, let's just move everything, honestly, at this point. Let's just take all of this stuff uh, and then move it into our printer config. So I think the probe is required to be added, but in order to do that automatic configuration, you'll have to you know, adjust your, um, or change that over. So let's just add that to the very bottom, right before macros. So this is all of our config for the EVB. Let's do a, um, a section, I'm gonna copy this right here. We're gonna call it um, EVB 36 config and save and restart. And then I am going to do one thing further, completely remove this config file and then delete, delete that. Um, do we save it? Cool. Wait, what did I just delete? Did I delete the wrong thing? <laughs> did I delete something I wasn't supposed to? Um, okay. What was that error message? Did I do anything? Okay, it's just getting late at night, so I don't know what I did. All right, preheating the bed back to 60C. It has been soaking for a bit, and I'm gonna preheat my extruder to 230. That's showing what I do my Z offset tests with. Make sure all the filament's melted well enough. Yeah, I'll. Wait, yeah, when I edit this video, um, I'll I'll get to see if I actually do this, delete to something. Yeah, do I really need all those config files? That seems excessive, doesn't it? Uh, all right, so let's do, before we do our Z offset for the last time, let's do a home printer, QGL, rehome the Z axis, and we should be good. I think my probe config points might be slightly off, but Okay. Yeah, so far so good. Um, if I was running the proper version of Beacon, where the tool head or the, the plug comes up, it might actually work with this <laughs> properly. Might even be worth getting the version that you can solder yourself so that way, if you need to change it for whatever reason, you can unsolder the connector. You can do it, printer. You can QGL. There we go. What happened here? Did it not move up fast enough? What happened here? Tool had to stop below model range. 
Huh. I don't know what happened there. Let's change our acceleration back to 500, just in case. How can you make a bigger 3D printer? Well, um, a design like this, 2.4, where the bed is fixed, is very easy to scale up. This is a 350 printer. If you're looking for a cheap, a cheap 3D printer with a big bed, then you're probably looking at a bed slinger. What happened on the X? Let me try rehoming the X. I want to make sure that that hits properly. It does. And then the Y. Hmm. Maybe I do want... Okay, I might have to edit my custom homing sequence so that it it pulls back the X a little bit before homing the Y, just to make sure. Because I need it to be extremely, extremely consistent. But for now, it's fine. I'm not actually doing a tool change right now. All right, uh, what's next? Uh, let's do a Z home. And reheat everything back up because it just cooled down. And then we're going to run something called beacon. Uh, beacon underscore calibrate. Instead of a probe calibrate, it's beacon calibrate. So same exact process as a regular probe. We're going to run our piece of paper underneath there. In my case, this is a bean boozled little, a thicker cardstock. And I can actually go to the front of the printer and use the screen. Let's do that. Um, I don't want to actually rest my, rest my hand on there. Uh, move. Let's see. Oh, it tells you move distance. Let's do one or a nozzle. Does it tell you where it's at? It does four, three, two, one. And then let's just move it down in 0.1 increments until it touches. It's touching. Now let's raise it up. Well, that's nice. Yeah, I love that config. Let me show you what I'm looking at. That's just right here. The super, super nice config. You get to choose how precise it is. You can even do five. You can go up and down five. Um, in this case, I'm going to point to point one and then, you know, adjust it until it's perfect. Raise it up. Not enough. So I'm going to go down one lower. That seems perfect. Then I can fine tune it with point zero one. Perfect. Then we can do accept. And then it's going to finish, finish doing the printer stuff. So I just calibrated the Z axis. Cool. Ah, like big to print car parts. Yeah. You're looking at building a giant version of this essentially. But it costs a lot of money. Look at the the Voron Phoenix, <laughs> just for reference, if you want to build a big printer. But you know, there's a couple different designs that have bigger, bigger beds, and they're for some reason more popular now. <laughs> giant printers. I think giant printers are a thing because companies use them as a hey, this is what I can make. Only five people are going to want this printer, but hey, we can make a 600 millimeter printer. No problem. 900 millimeter printer. No problem. All right. We are ready to print. We are actually ready to print. So let me uh, move the Z up a little bit. A little bit of a pro tip. If your printer isn't homed and you want to raise the Z axis, you can just click the Z home and it's going to yell at you saying, hey, you got to home your XY first. <laughs> But that's fine because it's going to move the Z up. Keyboard scales well. Yeah, 
you, but then you have to start, you know, considering the giant bed. And the issue with giant beds is that you're not going to get one big sheet of aluminum. You're going to have different sheets kind of put together next to each other uh, to make it easier. So you kind of need to be fixed on a something. So what are we going to print first? Usually this is what I do. I go to my, what are we at? Um, here's my tap changer. All right. Uh, new, new project. Select an appropriate profile. Uh, let's see. I have so many profiles on here. Don't mind the mess. Um, sure. Sure. Uh, let's actually do the. I think I'm going for Trident. Um. Oh God, I, I don't even. I don't even know. You know what? Let's just do this profile. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, let's make sure that this has a 0.4 nozzle set up. Um, shooter. Oh, 0.5. Glad I checked that. 0.4. And then 0.08 and 0.32 max. Good enough. 0.8 retraction. 45 and 30 is good enough for starting point. Yeah, if you want to build a giant printer, you're on you're not really on your own, but you're on your own to do the sourcing for parts, and you'll probably be cutting custom things and and doing custom things um but you really gotta see if it's worth it because it might not be do you have a custom bed what is going on here do we have a bed enabled i guess we do i should i guess we should have just uh why, why why does it have a custom huh weird i should have copied a, a 350 so it would have the the right bed showing Eh, doesn't matter. Just function. So we are going to add a print. The first print I like to do is um, this one. This is a little test disc, just so we can do our Z offset. That's all. So two things. Number one, we're going to enable a skirt. We're going to do a 10 width skirt at... Um, just one layer high. Let's do that. So that'll pretty much do this. We can kind of roughly tune it with the skirt. Remember, we, we wanted to go a little high at the beginning. And then as this prints this disc, we can um, dial it in better. I'm gonna verify that the, um, this hot end is uh, a red red hot end for Revo is 0 0.4, right? Yeah, it feels like it's tight. <laughs> I can never remember the Revo Revo colors. I don't use them that much. I usually do high flow hot ends or V6. I really like tungsten carbide nozzles. I think we're set. Uh, no, we're not set. We got to do the connection. Um, this is on 133. Under device UI is 133. Okay. And print. It's going to yell at us because we did something wrong. Upload and print. Oh, it's homing. It's homing. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Exclude objects and do weird things. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me stop it and then just do it remove exclude object for now because I'll have to add that. A couple more things we have to do. We haven't tuned really anything yet. Oh, um, well, one thing we definitely need to do is adjust our extruder. We need pressure advance. <laughs> we need pressure advance set up. So let me copy that over from this printer. 
definitely want some form of pressure advance and PWM cycle time. Let's see. There we go. Almost forgot. Let's start at 0.4. Yeah, exclude object's awesome. And let's also add this PWM cycle time, PWM cycle time to our uh, bed heater too. Uh, so we don't cause lights to flicker when it's PWMing. Um, bed, bed, bed. What the heck is that? Bed, mesh, heater bed. Okay. Heater M cycle time. Right now I do have a 0.8 max power. Not for warping, but for um, like how many watts this bed can draw. I think it can draw like 750 watts. So I want to reduce it so I don't blow a circuit. <laughs> Having like 20 printers running at the same time. All right, try it again. So uh, I'm gonna resend it because I disabled um, exclude object. Of course, I'm going to get everything set up correctly after this stream tomorrow. But for now, oh, uh, I also need to load the filament. I think it's gonna wait for the bed to heat up. So let's use this opportunity to maybe try to press this filament down into the hot end. I forgot to do that. This is why I need the smart uh, orbiter sensor. This is not going in. Smart orbiter sensor so I can automatically load filament. I really need that in my life. Uh, we have a YouTube sub. Thank you so much. If you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel yet, Make sure to do so. It will be worth your time, I guarantee it. Or your money back. I can't give you your time back, but I can give you your money back. And is this printing? It is. <laughs> it is printing. We are, oh yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, so what I'll typically do for one of the Vorons is because of the thick bed, it takes longer to heat up. So I overheat the bed for the first layer to 65C, and then I let it cool back down to 60. And that'll allow it to, you know, spend a little bit more time heat soaking. Um, I can even decrease it to 55C if I wanted to. But I want it to get to a certain temperature before I print. How do you like the build quality of the Dr uh, Dragon Burner LDO extruder? Um, Dragon Burner, like like the tool head. Dragon Burner is amazing. Dragon Burner Eight, especially if you're using the the bottom mount. I had to remove mine for beacon compatibility, but it's extremely rigid. The cooling is great. Uh, maybe the wiring could be ever so slightly better, but honestly, I'm pretty impressed with the wiring. Even like just it's so clean. And it's so small. What are you going to print? I'm printing a circle. It's a boring test print. But it, we need to set our Z offset somehow. So might as well print a circle. What's the other tool head? I feel like Dragon Burner for high flow. That is a uh, Rapid Burner. It's a slightly longer version of a rap Dragon Burner. And it supports up to a Goliath. Just make sure you're using a sock. Otherwise, you'll melt the, the shroud. There's another. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Zol. This is a Zol tool head, but that thing's a pain to work with. And then, uh, what is it? it? Armchair engineering? I think armchair. Is it annex or armchair? One of those two. They have a new set of extruders, but those are also overbuilt. All you really need is Dragon Burner, in my opinion. Changed my mind. <laughs> Dragon Burner with some Fabrico 12K fans. Yeah, that, that's good.
Dragon Burner CPAP. I think there's a... What happened there? Uh, move exceeds maximum extrusion. Oh! Of course it does. Of course it does. Okay. Did that go too low? No, it's fine. Okay. Um. Uh, okay, so... Keep this at 65, I guess. And then 230. <laughs> Flipper, get rid of your stupid safe safety guard. It's so annoying. Every time I make a new config, I gotta set these two lines right here. Every single time. Every time. Uh, like I, the printer is unusable until I until I change them. It's wild to me. Um. Oh, okay, right here. So I set it right at the beginning of my extruder tab. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how they can save your printer or whatever. Like if your config's that bad, or if you're trying to tell it to do something that's actually harming the printer, that's on you. Okay, reprint. So you get to watch that process again. I swear to God, every time I do a new print, it, <laughs> I go to do my start print macro, and it's like, Ugh, sorry, <laughs> you're, you're, you can't purge. <laughs> you, you can't purge. Oh, do we set our maximum flow rate for that? I guess not. Doesn't matter. Default is so low that always triggers it. Yeah, that that is. Like they can increase it, honestly. If they still want to have one in place, just increase it. So it's gonna do another QGL. Because we didn't touch it, it might actually just do one measurement and call it a day. Maybe. Nope. It's going to do some micro adjusting. I haven't fully... So with the 2.4, there's a couple of steps to do to level the, the gantry. Um, the first step is to loosen the all, all four screws holding this together. So loosen those big M5 bolts. Do a quad gantry level and then retighten them while it's level like while the machine thinks it's level i just did that but um if it's slightly off it's going to want to resort to a untrammed position but yeah when you're tightening those screws the first time make sure the gantry itself is as level as possible and then after you do a qgl like this then you can fine tune it there's a mod that uses bearings like trident that does help significantly with this. You can just do a couple passes and it's usually fine. I wonder what the max probing speed is for beacon. It always seems like it's too slow. Should probably increase that. Yeah, I know it's good for accuracy, but... I want speed! As this part's fast. Oh, you know what? You know what? I think I have a solution to that. There's a macro that if you get under a certain amount of deviation, it won't even lift the tool head. It'll just probe it. I've never used beacon on a 2.4, so, hmm, interesting. It won't matter. By the time I get that set up, I'll have a tool changer. Yeah, the GE5C uh, bearings. That's why I have my original 2.4. And it's a much better design than the stock 2.4. I'd be surprised if that doesn't become stock for the final version. Or not final version, but the next version of the 2.4. Once they rename it to something that's not 2.4, 2.5. Do you know how to... to pro, do you have to know how to program use Clipper? Absolutely not. Nope. It's more coding than anything, but it's 
it's like a config file. Yeah, it's like you can generally find like a pre-done config. Yeah, scripting. You're taking pins for the most part. You're taking pins, which are um, outputs on your control board. So those are all documented. You're taking pins and you're telling them to do things. All right, are we digging into our brand new bed? Let's see. No, but we're not extruding any film either. <laughs> uh, oh, um, did I invert my logic? You have got to be kidding me. Every single time I go to print with an orbiter, I have to <laughs> invert my logic. Okay, all right, that's fine. We're fine. <laughs> Take three? I should have checked that before. That, that was my fault. You should always check your extruder settings. Oh, dear Lord. All right. Um, so our direction pin for the extruder is reversed. No, it, it's every extruder. It's always... I always get it wrong. It's always inverted. All the logic, every single time. Uh, luckily, though, I did wire this printer correctly. So I was able to use the uh, 2.4 config from LDO. And I touched the bed, so it's going to need to... QGL. So let's talk about what needs to be done before we convert this over to a tool changer. That's a good... So that's what we're doing now. I'm gonna make sure that it is printing. So I'll run through you know, a variety of test models with different filaments, etc. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna test ABS quite yet because it has to enclose the whole thing. So we're just gonna running PLA. I might run PTG, but. Um, oh, is the mic cutting out? Is it better now? Yeah, I gotta get a new mic. Um, that's on my... My list of things to get for 2024. What's this saying? Um, yeah, so I'm gonna print with the printer. I'm going to fine-tune the homing routine. So making sure that it is 1000% accurate with the... Um, sensorless homing. So I'll figure out how I want to do that. It might end up being some weird way of homing or, you know, kind of like the bamboo, how the bamboo does like the, it's a, if you ever watch a bamboo home, it does some weird things. So I might have to do some weird things too to make sure that it's accurate. <laughs> Luckily we have the end stop on the Y axis. So that'll be, uh, you know, once we get the X correct, then this should be good. Yeah, autofocus is pretty good, huh? That's why I really like recording with this camera. Another thing I gotta get for 2024 is another proper um, recording camera like this. I'd love an overhead camera that is a little bit better than... Um, oops. Uh, than this. <laughs> Fixed with no autofocus. Uh, it's a great view. Look at that beacon go. All right, don't look at my mess. Look at this one. Much nicer. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're gonna be testing this out, making sure it works, getting the homing correct. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else really to do? There's not much. I'm gonna make a mount for those, the mellow flipper thingies. I gotta order all the rest of my parts. 2.4 on the front bottom or top, like the frame, kind of where the idler is. I've seen it there. Actually, KB3D has a 
a camera that I should probably use for this. It's a chamber camera. And I could probably mount it on the front, the front corner. Just enough to see if the print is failing or not. Ideally on a 2.4, you'd want to mount it on the frame. I've seen some rear extrusion mounts where it puts it kind of like right here. It faces forward. But I don't like cameras facing towards the front. <laughs> you know, for privacy reasons. Nozzle cam on each one of the tools. Oh god. Um, did we... Do we invert the right thing? Hold on. Is it... Is it extruding? I should have tested it first, I guess. Yes, it is extruding. Okay. Whew. We're good. Hey, there's our first, uh, our first extrusion. It's working. We did it, chat. We built a working printer. Uh, as noted, the Z offset's high, so I'm going to go into fine-tuning, and then just lower the Z. 0.05, let's see what that does. Yeah, I don't even know. I'm used to the, the web interface. All right, so this is the point where I kind of check it for for first layer goodness. Um, maybe the slightest bit low. Oh, it feels crunchy. Hmm. Let me raise it up a little. Um, That's better. Just touch it. Feels fine. All good enough for government work, I guess. Uh, the five inch screen kind of feels perfect on this size printer. I really like the five inch screen. I have a four inch screen on this printer down here that I couldn't get clipper screen working on. And this is just overall, it feels correct. You know, just like looking at it, it's just the right size screen. Doesn't take up too much room. Don't get a seven inch screen, it's so big. Um, it's like one of those little pads. It's so, so big. But yeah, looks like we at least have some extrusion. So there we go. We have a working, a working 3D printer. Yay. Hmm. What do you want to print next? You want to try another, another print on this? We'll do one more quick print. Let me pull something up real quick. Uh, hey, thank you for the follow. Do a new project. Let's undo the label objects. This is without input shaping too. I haven't uh, done input shaping yet, which I will do certainly after. I'll do um, print and shake or shake, shake and tune. <laughs> shake, shake, shake and tune. Which is a really easy way to, to visualize your prints in the slicer. So looks good enough. I'll go through the full, you know, uh, full rotation, di rotation distance tuning, flow tuning, making sure that everything's good. But it looks looks decent so far. Swatch truck. Yeah, I, I I should probably print a swatch truck, but that's more of a calibration print. I want to print something fun. Um, let's do a E3D buggy. There we go. New Year theme print. That would be a good idea. Uh, tomorrow, 
Uh, if you're watching this live, um, we'll be doing a, a New Year's stream. So that'll be a late one. That'll be fun. Hedgehog. Yeah, the Make Your Viking Hedgehog. That's a good print. It's a little big and isn't that featureful. Meaning like it's not that good of a test print um, that tests like overhangs and stuff like that. That being said, it's a good test print. I really like it. I have so many of these. I printed so many hedgehogs. And it's done. So it parked correctly and our first print is done. E3 spider. Yeah, let's let's do that. <laughs> oh man. Need a, not a scraper. Let's see, is it too close? Might be a hair too close. Not hard to tell though. Don't touch your bed like this, use an actual scraper. Um, looks like our flow might need to be increased. Maybe. Definitely. Interesting. Um, I just guessed on the, on all the stuff, but uh, let's increase our flow slightly. And then run a, another test print. Chep cube. Yeah, chep cube's a pretty good one. It's a 40 minute test. Let's at least print a little bit of it. So I'm going to save config on here. So it saves that Z offset. And then do another test print. Oh, I got to clear the purge line. No, I don't have to clear a purge line because it didn't put down a purge line. <laughs> there you go. What do you guys think so far? Now, if you're watching this just for the 2.4, you can stop here. This is actually a really great stopping point. You have your dragon burner mounted on here, um, beacon, uh, assuming you have the proper beacon, not the one I have, which is the low profile for like DZ bot. I think, I don't even know what it's for. It's for the EVA three that I had. And then of course, you know, running the, if I was running a actual single tool printer like this, I would have the cables come into a special umbilical um, little port right here. But for this build, I'm gonna have too many to do that. So it's gonna be set up differently. So we'll find the best way of running six, six cables to the back of the printer to the bottom. Yeah, I'm impressed how fast I built this too. When did I start this build? Hmm. It wasn't too long ago. But I really wanted to just start, you know, start to finish, do it as fast as possible. Hi, Robotics. Thank you for subscribing. Six months. Thank you so much. Long time. If you want to see a more detailed, uh, more detailed tap changer stuff since documentation is lacking? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in beta, right? So I will be recording as much of that process as possible and showing updates whenever possible. Different color coolant for each. What? Uh, water cool each. Oh, water cool. Oh, wow. Could you imagine that? <laughs> That'll be um, a little extra. At the minimum, we're doing different colored tool heads. We're doing a rainbow of tool heads. But I'm not printing any of the parts yet because they're being consistently revised. Uh, of course, I'll beta test uh, parts, but I'm not installing them until they're more or less complete. Now, I did get the the bushings in. I got the bushings in. That will need. So those are kind of cool. So assuming that that's correct, these will slot right into our printed part. And then this is what's going to give us the, the clearance required for the tap or the tool changing. 
So that's cool. I can't wait to get my pins in. I don't know when those are going to come. But I'm still waiting on a fair bit of stuff. So it's going to be a little while before this is an actual tool changer. So if you're on the edge of your seat, uh, no, I'm not building a tool changer tomorrow. It is going to be sometime next month. Um, first step is to just use this as a 3D printer, though. I want to just print as many things as possible on it. Six-way water cooling would be a pain? Yeah, it would be. Your printer is printing again? Yeah, that's awesome. Glad to hear. If you want to share anything you're printing, make sure to join my Discord and uh, post in there. I'd love to see what you're working on. Let's see if this worked. So no, no skirt needed. Oh, I also got to put the lights on here. I just got to finish up the general LDO kit stuff. So lights, uh, panels, skirts, etc. But other than that, it's pretty much it's printing. I, you know, uh, spool holder as well. Yeah, I can get my cereal. Just throw the back panel on and call it a day. <laughs> hey, Ugly Moo, how's it going? Welcome on in. So let's do uh, a couple layers of this at least, and then I think we'll call it for today. Yeah, we'll have a working tap changer by the end of um, January, for sure. That is the goal. There we go. Uh, thank you, Apex Snapma, for the Prime subscription. Very appreciated. Thank you. Look at that little thing go. <laughs> this is a big printer. Now, this is kind of my generic fast, but also quality speeds that I run. And uh, 350, 2.4 isn't much different than a 250, or sorry, 300. The belts are slightly longer and there are more moving masses, but uh, I think with the slight weight reduction of the self burner gone, I think we can print faster on this than the the regular 2.4. Um, that being said, these are the stock LDO 0 0.9 degree motors, which will be useful for quality. But, you know, not top raw speed. But hey, if you need to print faster than this, then... Well, I don't know. This is... Plenty fast for, for my needs. Uh, this is on a Revo, too. Yeah, these aren't superpowers. We're not pushing crazy speeds. So we're going to have slightly similar performance, if not higher performance, on uh, the final version of this with the those awesome little uh, hot ends that I'll be installing. Link in the video description if you want to check those out. But this right here is a Revo Voron with a 0.4 nozzle standard. Uh, someone was following your footsteps and building a stealth changer, tap changer. Would you recommend building the 2.4 stock first, then upgrading to the tool changer? Uh, yes, yes. So I mentioned at the beginning, of the beginning of this build that it's very important to have a working printer first. Uh, do not jump right into the tool changer. I know it sounds exciting. You want to build a tool changer, but you need to at least get like a week's worth of printing done. Really make sure that your printer is dialed in and printing well. And get a bunch of reference prints. If your quality is bad with the tool changer, you know, with the tap changer, self changer, whatever you do, and you didn't print anything previously, they don't have no idea of knowing if it's, well, okay, you can troubleshoot, but, you know, is it the, is it the tool changer? Is it this? Is it that? 
So the proper process, in my opinion, for this build would be getting to this point. Okay, you can use Stealth Burner, you can use whatever you want, but get yourself a working 2.4. Okay, that's step one. Step two is going to be installing your, your tap. Not the tool changer, just one tool. A single tool that has the uh, whatever you went with for your, your tap mechanism. Uh, not regular tap, I mean the tap changer tap. So you have tap changer, you have tap changer light, and stealth changer. Those are your current options, there might be more when this video is released. But get that and then build it as a single tool and then again, print with it. Make sure that that works. And then once that's done, once you confirm that, hey, I can build a working tap system, then you can add on your tools and then start calibrating those, etc. And that's the point where you'll start dealing with multiple extruders and you'll have to edit all kinds of clipper config stuff, calibrate them. Oh, I do have a Ember Prototypes CXC coming in. That's their little camera for calibration. So we'll be using that for our, our nozzle alignment. Um, so we'll be exploring all that, how that works. And I'll be doing some of that off stream, on stream, etc. It's going to be quite the process. I'll document as much as possible. But of course, you know, I, I like to play around with things for many hours before doing a video like this. I did all my wiring off camera because I wanted to make sure it was done correctly and and neatly. So I'll take a picture of the basement of this and it does look pretty good. I'm very happy with it. Yeah, CXC, a modbot has a video on it. If you are interested, his video is probably gonna be um, you know, better than the one I can make. But I'll be using it, I'll be showing it off on stream. Tap changer, light game tap changer. Uh, oh, interesting. Okay, well. This is a very quickly evolving project. Lots of moving parts. Yeah, if you want, um, yeah, print, print a stealth burner. But that being said, if you're, if you know you're going to convert this thing over to a dragon burner based okay that that's a great point if you're going to be us, using dragon burner tools print a dragon burner and install it if you're going to be using uh, stealth burner tools which you get five stealth burner tools versus six dragon burners not a big deal for a lot of people um, same thing as a Prusa XL five tools then you can print off an entire stealth burner and install it my recommendation is to do identical tools. So in my configuration, I'm gonna have um, six orbiters, six of those dragon mount bamboo hot ends, and six EVB 36 boards, all on six identical dragon burners. Um, for now, they're all gonna have the same nozzle size. Maybe one of them will be a, a fat nozzle, like a, a, a one millimeter, etc. For you know special purposes. Uh, actually, if, if I can get the nozzle nut size, regardless, I think most of it'll be 0.4. It's a tool changer. You want 0.4 on there for most things. Self burner dock retire requires a cross gantry extrusion. That's true. That's true. The drag burners will mount directly onto the top of the frame. A um, little bit of a mod review. So I'm using the the beefy front idlers and the beefy Z idlers. I like both of them quite a bit. I I do. I feel like the beefy Z idlers take up a little bit of room, but I don't think it gets in the way of anything. They're kind of open, so if you if you like that look, I think it looks pretty cool. They look angry. Um what else are we using for mods here? Of course, the whole tool head system. This is the first time I've ever used a dragon burner in, replace, in replacement of self burner. And I think it's working fantastic. I love working on dragon burners. They're so easy. 
The only downside is that the cables are partially visible. But even then you can print off covers for your your tool head board and you know th there's ways of getting around it. For the most part, it's fine. And also there's definitely better looking uh, board or mounts for your EBB. This one's just part of the current Dragonburn ecosystem, so it works well. Hey Victoria, welcome on in. Wow, oh, what other mods are we using? I don't think there's too much. Uh, I already went over the skirts. Those are mostly aesthetic. We have an EBB 36, which we've improperly wired, but that's fine. You can do tap on a bed slinger. Um, I would say no mainly because the bed has to be super rigid for tap. It has to be very rigid. So you have to have a really thick bed that has no deflection at all. If you can if you can move the bed up and down by pressing on it, it's not stiff enough. And even the rigid mounted beds, they still have a little bit of play. Uh, that being said, the the CR10SE which is the printer I have behind me. It does have a very stiff bed, but even then, I don't know. It's still not as as stiff as like one of these beds. So not enough to put the whole entire weight of tap on there. Probably not. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it for mods. Uh, of course, we're gonna be modding it way further than this. So this is a great starting point. It looks like our print is doing pretty well. So we're gonna fine tune everything, dial in a profile for this and just have some fun printing. So if you have any suggestions for things you'd like to see printed on here before we switch it out to the full on tap changer, let me know, maybe I can swing it. This is my first proper 350 millimeter wide printer. Uh, the previous one was a little bit uh, jank. So yeah, I can print off some big things on here. I'm very excited. So this will be the conclusion of, I guess the 2.4 build part of this series. On the next video, we're gonna start getting into Tap Changer. Um, the next time I stream, we'll probably be installing the, um, the Stealth Changer onto here, replacing Dragon Burner in its current configuration. So we'll be running tap. That's a lot of fun. I can't wait for that. Um, well, if you're watching this live on Twitch, stick around for the after party. If you're watching on YouTube, I will see you in the next video. Make sure to check out my Twitch channel for live streams like this. They're a lot of fun. It's fun to chat with everyone and get involved. Uh, other than that, make sure you subscribe to this channel. I have a lot of content on 3D printing, a lot of custom printers, building printers, and I'll be doing some printer reviews in 2024. Make sure to support the channel by checking out my merchandise. I have some awesome merch. Um, they're actually the same, same vendor as ModBot, so both me and ModBot have the softest merch ever. Crazy, crazy nice shirts. I love them. Find some hats in there too if you want to, again, support the channel. If you want to uh, get access to my Patreon Discord, I do have a, a private section in there. And of course, if you're subscribed to a certain tier, you can get direct support for anything you might need that's 3D printed or related that I can assist you with. So if you want to sign up for that, just let me know over on Discord. Otherwise, this has been a great series and there will be more parts to this. I'm not going to abandon it. Don't worry. This is no Rook, Rook Mark 2 or Rook Mark 1 Part 2. Uh, this is going to be something that I am extremely excited about and will most likely be the future of 3D printing tool changers for multicolor. So, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate every single one of you. Make sure to leave a comment down below anything. 
anything that's appropriate. Leave a comment. YouTube likes it. Like this video. Subscribe. Have a great day. Good morning. Good evening. Good night. And goodbye.